the power of attraction, a phenomenon that people make use of in many ways. Magnetism is invisible, but it is always present. It drives electric motors and makes loudspeakers vibrate. We encounter it when we clean our teeth. We need it to go shopping or for traveling. But the most famous symbol of magnetism is undoubtedly the compass. We cannot see magnetic fields, but they can make themselves visible. Place magnets under iron filings on a sheet of paper and they will align themselves along field lines as they know. The Earth itself is surrounded by a magnetic field. Even the Greeks knew about the wondrous property of magnetite. Placed near metals, pieces of this iron oxide material displayed a magical power of attraction. In China, devices similar to compasses were already in use some 2,000 years ago. In 1117, Chu Yus made the first documented mention of a compass used for orientation purposes. It consisted of a magnetic needle inserted in a straw which floated in a bowl of water. The device, it is said, was applied by seafarers, but it could not have been of much use, especially in rough seas. Around 1250, Sailors in the Mediterranean attached a magnetic needle in such a way that it could rotate freely about its central point. The compass as we know it had been invented. But for a long time, just why compass needles aligned themselves in a north-south direction remained a puzzle. Scientists suspected that the cause was a gigantic mountain of magnetite somewhere in the far north. Terrible tales were told of ships that had sailed too close to the mountain. Its enormous attraction is said to have wrenched the nails from planks and pulled seamen to their death. Around the year 1600, English researcher William Gilbert set out to refute such superstitious beliefs. He showed, for instance, that magnetism was not destroyed by garlic nor intensified by diamonds. Gilbert described his experiments in a treatise entitled De Magnete. He used a lump of magnetite to reconstruct the behavior of compass needles on the Earth's surface. Gilbert was able to observe the phenomenon of inclination. Only at the equator did the needle remain horizontal. The closer it got to one of the poles, the more it inclined, so that at the poles themselves it assumed a vertical position. From this evidence, Gilbert developed the theory that the Earth is one enormous magnet. Shortly after the compass had become established as a means of navigation, sailors noticed that the needle did not always point exactly to the North Pole. This phenomenon is known as declination. In the 18th century, scientific research began to focus on the Earth's magnetic field. Much of what we know about it today is due to the work of physicist and mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss. Gauss created the foundations for a systematic study of the Earth's magnetic field. The only child of poor parents, Carl Friedrich Gauss was born in Brunswick, Germany on April 30, 1777. At school, it soon became clear that the boy was a mathematical genius. Indeed, Later in life, Gauss said he learned to calculate before he learned to speak. He was presented to the Duke of Brunswick, who granted the boy a scholarship. This enabled Gauss to attend grammar school and later university. When his patron died in battle, Gauss accepted a post as professor of mathematics in Göttingen and also became director of the city's observatory. But fate was cruel to Karl Friedrich. Within the space of a year, he lost his father, his wife, and the youngest of his three children. Gauss now devoted all his efforts to science. In addition to mathematics, his interest was focusing more and more on astronomy. As a youth, he had astonished experts by calculating the orbit of the asteroid Ceres with great precision. 
Ceres had disappeared behind the sun and reappeared at the exact time and in the exact position worked out by Gauss. The heliotrope. Gauss developed this instrument after being commissioned in 1816 to carry out a land survey of the Kingdom of Hanover. It was a task that occupied him for 25 years and enabled him to make many important discoveries. For a perfectionist like Gauss, conventional instruments of the day were not accurate enough. Like them, the heliotrope used sunlight to determine the position of survey points in the field. But Gauss's heliotrope was able to reflect rays of light over much greater distances. Carl Friedrich Gauss was a universal genius. There was hardly an area of the natural sciences that did not arouse his interest. In the field of mathematics, for instance, Gauss calculated the curve of normal distribution. This is not an abstract concept, but a rule that can often be observed in nature. For example, in the size of potatoes. Only a few are small, most are of average size, and again, only a few are much bigger. In carrying out his measurements, Gauss noticed this trend towards the average. He rarely registered values that deviated substantially from it. Gauss drew a diagram of this frequency, it shows a bell-shaped curve. But let's get back to his true passion, geomagnetism. In 1832, naturalist Alexander von Humboldt asked Gauss for his support in setting up a worldwide network for observing magnetism. Gauss and his colleague Wilhelm Weber thought it was a brilliant idea. Among other places, they managed to have observatories established in Scandinavia and Siberia and even in Tasmania. In order to measure changes in the Earth's magnetic field, Gauss designed the magnetometer. Its main elements are a pendulum and an ordinary compass. A simple construction, but the demands on its precision are high. A telescope has to be used to read its scale, because a mere intake of breath could falsify the reading. Gauss and Weber wanted to avoid such distortions at all cost. So their observation station in Göttingen was built entirely without metal, to ensure it had no influence whatsoever on the Earth's magnetic field. They would carry out research here sometimes to the point of exhaustion, taking readings every five minutes for a period of 24 or even 36 hours. Comparisons with data from the international observatories gradually gave Gauss and Weber an overall picture of the Earth's magnetic field. Almost on the side, so to speak, Gauss and Weber built the first operational telegraph system. Through their study of magnetism, they knew how electricity could be converted into motion by means of wire coils and permanent magnets. Their transmitter used electricity to generate an artificial magnetic field, which set an impulse sender in motion. They stretched a wire right across the roofs of Göttingen from Weber's Institute of Physics to Gauss's observatory where they really were able to receive the impulses from the sender without any distortion. In 1839, Gauss summarized the results of his research in his General Theory of Geomagnetism, a work that is regarded as his most important contribution to the field of physics, and which served as an inspiration to many young researchers. Ten years later, the head of Munich University's observatory, Johann von Lamont, focused on the fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field. He attributed this to irregular sunspot activity. We know today that enormous solar eruptions release high-energy particles. 
When this solar wind, as it is known, strikes the Earth's outer atmosphere, the latter becomes electrically charged, causing fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field. So Lamont's theory was correct. Without its magnetic field, the Earth would be a dead planet. It protects life from the high energy solar wind. Without this protective screen, evolution would have taken a different course. Life would probably never have been able to leave the waters. At the poles, the magnetic field is closer to the Earth's surface. So solar storms penetrate further into the atmosphere. The destructive force of the solar storms becomes apparent when they damage transcontinental high-tension power lines in the far north. The powerful magnetic field produces high current levels in the lines, destroying sensitive components like transformers. But where does the Earth's magnetic field actually come from? The view that there is a gigantic magnet in the Earth's interior soon proved to be too simplistic. But it was not until 1919 that Joseph Lamour came up with a plausible explanation. The outer molten core of our planet has a temperature of around 3,600 degrees Celsius. The inner core is about 1,500 degrees hotter. As a result, powerful thermal currents occur in the interior. The Earth's rotation deflects these currents, which perform a spiral movement parallel to the Earth's axis. The outer metallic core is an electrical conductor. As with a dynamo, electricity is generated and a magnetic field forms. This field has always changed considerably. The position of the magnetic poles is constantly moving. Over the last 100 years, the North Pole alone has shifted by 10 kilometers. The magnetic field has even disappeared completely on several occasions and reappeared shortly afterwards, sometimes with reversed polarity. The history of the Earth's magnetism is written in solidified volcanic rock. Geologists are able to read the field lines of the past. We know, for instance, that the latest reversal of the poles took place around three quarters of a million years ago. On average, such processes occur every half a million years, so the next reversal of poles will soon be due. The Earth's magnetic field has in fact been getting weaker for around 2,000 years. Geophysicists are striving to calculate the movements of the molten rock in the Earth's interior, but forecasts are simply impossible. If the protective magnetic field were to collapse for a longer period, the consequences for mankind would be devastating. The sun, which gives life, would mercilessly destroy it again. Man's genetic material is highly susceptible to the solar wind. Genetic defects would be inevitable. Counter species would suddenly die out because some birds, fish and turtles use the Earth's magnetic field for navigation they would have no way of finding their bearings on their migrations. A stable geomagnetic field is also important from a technological point of view. Most satellite defects, for instance, are the result of electromagnetic turbulence. The breakdown of communication systems would bring economic and social life to a standstill. Researchers at the southern tip of Africa are currently registering eddies in the Earth's magnetic field. Some scientists believe they are the precursors of reversed polarity. Without geomagnetism, the good old compass wouldn't work either. Then, even Carl Friedrich Gauss would have trouble finding his way.